the exposure is so bad. Uh, if anybody shows up, this is probably going to disappear, by the way. So I'm testing my internet speeds to see if I can even do a live stream. But I can't even control. There's the newbie journal. Good evening. Oh, look, people are showing up and it's working. And that's cat. How is the exposure? It just looks messed up to me at this end. Anyway, so this is going to be about 30 minutes max. Here's Adam Holmes. Yeah, Adam Holmes, by the way. Everybody say hi to Adam. He is a big helper here. And there's Doug, Jill King. Welcome, everybody. If you guys have, I'm just having a hot chocolate because what we have going on here, we have a winter storm coming in. My area is going to get about six inches tonight. So the bees are all buttoned up. That's the good news. And uh, hello to Anita. Hello, everyone from Wisconsin. I used to live in Kenosha, by the way. And uh, this is just casual. Looks pink. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, if I knew how to control this thing, I would change it. So for those of you who are here seeing this live, you're probably the other. There's Larry Lee. Glad to see all you guys. Anyway, I know the exposure is bad. I know. This is casual. This is sitting down, turning on a laptop, putting it on the table here where I normally do my uh, Friday Q&As. And I'm just feeling things out. See, we have people here from the UK because here it's our time, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in the United States. So actually people all over the world can be in sync. We're not waking anybody up in the middle of the night. Thailand, are you serious? There's Matt Sweeney. Okay. Yeah, love hate relationship with the electronics. You know it. I would like to have manual control over this camera. This is one of those Logitech, Logi streaming cameras. I need to uh, fix it. Anybody have anything they want to talk about in the 30 minutes that I'm going to be here? And I'm going to stick to that because I was told I only have 30 minutes to be down here. And, uh, North Carolina is here. Let's see. Hey, Mac from Canada. Gary, plant trees. Yes, you're reading my shirt. That's the uh, Arbor Day Society. On my property, since I've been here, I planted over 250 trees. It used to just be a hay field. Started planting in 1999. Here we go. Somebody says moisture control for the winter. Very broad subject. Uh, the newbie journal, Fred, did you see the last presentation from Randy Oliver on OAV frequency? No, but I have a meeting coming up with Randy Oliver. That's the good news early next year. So I'm sure we're going to talk about oxalic acid treatments. Frequency is at about four or five day uh, intervals now until they get them under control. But I have a plan of my own for next spring for those Varroa. At this time of year, the brood is reducing. So you might get a warm day at the end of November, beginning of December around here with low to no brood, and you can give, give a one-time oxalic acid vaporization hit. Did you close all hives the same, or are you testing different ways? All my hives this year, well, I have some variables there. Steve, that's a pizza. Thank you. So anyway, all hives are roughly the same. They all have insulated covers. We have different hive designs. So remember we have the Layens hive out here that's insulated with lamb's wool. We have the horizontal hive that's insulated with polystyrene, um, the long lang. And then the other hives are using that B-Smart design. I went ahead and put these on every single hive this year because they, I already know they need insulation on the top. And I'm doing some different things with the insulation around the food, around that rapid round feeder. So we're gonna see how that goes. And we're gonna have those uh, brood minder, just temp sensors up there, no humidity counting this year. And uh, did I get the Hive Alive fondant? Anita wants to know. Funny you should mention that. Ta-da. I just got this stuff. So I am doing this to 50% of the hives this year. And what I'm gonna do is put this right on the inner cover. Some people say this plastic is really heavy duty, but other people in the UK have sent me pictures of their Hive Alive fondant on their inner covers, just over that hole on the inner cover. 
and then they cut a little X right in the center of the bottom there, and they can see the bees through the plastic up inside eating the hive live pollen. So that's a test this year. But you know what's weird about this stuff? Look at this. It's very moist. It's very pliable. For those of you who don't know, um, Hive Alive makes a liquid additive for your sugar syrup. Thank you, Noel, for that. And uh, it's been proven to help with Nozema, Nozema serrani. There's Nozema apis also, but Nozema apis has pretty much gone away. So this is going to help your bees with their microbiome, their midgut, and their hindgut trying to reduce the chances of Nozema spore buildup in there. And Hive Alive has been proven to do that in liquid form. We're gonna see how it does it with the fondant, but it's gonna be very interesting. What topics are you maybe going to cover at the Hive Life Conference? This is a comment from Matt. Well, you know what, for those of you who don't know, there's a Hive Life Cons uh, convention coming up in Tennessee, and I'm gonna be there in January. And I was talking to Cayman Reynolds, by the way, go check out his channel if you've never heard of him. Chances are you have if you're watching any kind of bee videos. And uh, I'm going there, but guess what my job is? To mingle. I'm going to just walk around and I'm going to be talking to the vendors and looking at new inventions and stuff. And we're going to be creating some YouTube content there. So my job, and I love that job description, is just to be there and meet people. So talk to people. So Mark says, got my hive alive too. All right, good. And Max got a question. Opened my hives a week ago and found that two hives were dead. Noticed a lot of the dead bees were mostly the ab were mostly the abdomen. Would this be a sign of yellow jacket attack? I'm not sure I understand that. Let me see. My question is. Opened my hives two weeks ago and found that two hives were dead and noticed a lot of the dead bees were mostly the abdomen. I don't understand. Uh, if the dead bees have been chewed apart, if yellow jackets are harvesting your dead bees, they don't go after the abdomen at all. They go after the thorax because that's where the protein, the muscle is and everything else. That's also why they, you know, they pull things apart and they make a little protein pellet before they fly off. But to see an abdomen damage, that would be something else. Uh, <clears throat> that's why I sent it. I remember we all locked down from COVID and did a live video. Help me through then. Okay. No heads up. Just the abdomen, I think. Okay, so um, if it's just the abdomen, I don't know what's going on there. Sorry to say. Most uh, things that are predating on the bees are going after. Oh, all of the abdomens were left. That makes sense. So that could be wasps still harvesting. Although where we are, the wasps right now are backing off on the protein. So they're after nectar because those are the queens that are going to be wintering over by themselves. So wasp nests are in a big drawdown. They're in a southern area where it's still warm or some places where the wasps have a nest that continues all through the year. I don't envy those people, by the way. But if just the abdomen is left, then that could in fact be a wasp, you bet. And Steve says, wish I could be there. Me, Cayman, and all you guys. It's really gonna be fun at that Hive Life conference because these are there are a lot of YouTubers that are going to be there uh, that we've all seen. You know, We've seen some of each other's videos. And I think Cayman tried to pick a bunch of people that he thought might get along. So I'm gonna try to be nice to people there. But it's going to be fun to meet people in person and because you feel like you know people when you've seen them on YouTube, but then you realize you've never met them. I mean, so it's going to be fun. And some people are giving formal presentations, obviously. Bob Binney, people like that. Uh, I think Ian Stepler, Canadian beekeeper, is going to be giving a presentation. I'm just there to visit, just to hang out. So that's going to be good. Uh, let's see. Live on podcast. Let's see, Mark, how's the foam job on your Be Smart inner cover? It's settled. It's good. I'm waiting for a bunch of uh, expansion foam for that, too. There is a video, for those of you who don't know, where I showed how I bonded the insulated inner cover by Be Smart Designs to a medium frame. And then I insulated the inner surfaces there so that I could uh, encapsulate the whole thing and have the moderate amount of heat that comes up through the center of your wrapping around feeders actually warm that space a little bit and give a better access to the feed, the dry feed that's gonna be up there. And in some cases, of course, is hive 
a lot of fondant. So stuff like that. Uh, we're going to see how that goes. It's just, we're just playing games and doing things to help the bees with their insulation. Uh, so that's how the foam's going. I like it so far. I just cut it too soon. I should have waited until it really settled. Give it 72 hours before you start carving and shaping foam. The other thing is somebody asked about the foam and whether or not the off-gassing could be harmful to the bees and everything. So I did check out the MSDS sheets and stuff, but most of the hazards exist before it's cured. Once it's cured, it's even safe, according to the manufacturer, safe for your pets to chew it and stuff. So it kind of says the speed seems fine. I hope I'm staying clear because, as you know, historically, my internet lets me down, which is why I don't do live streams, period because it'll all break up and then everybody talks about how I'm frozen. Uh, Doug B, can you explain why you stopped using upper entrance ventilation? Yes, because of a whole series of studies that have been done on the interior thermal dynamics of the beehive. And uh, of course, Dr. Tom Seeley at Cornell University um, talked a lot about it and we've all abandoned upper venting and upper entrances, which is something I used to do because I thought it was great. It has some, it, it all can change because of the configuration of your hives too and the size of the hive. So you have to understand it's a complete package. So I'm down to uh, a single deep, maximum two deeps. That's the biggest hive going into winter here. People with much larger hives have much moisture, larger bee population. So it's kind of a moving target when it comes to whether or not you vent a little bit, but the venting, uh, we stopped last year, in fact, and last year I had a very good year through winter while a whole bunch of other people lost their bees. Um, so a healthy colony bee is a good cluster that can stay warm, uh, does very well without the upper entrance, and that venting through the upper entrance has been proven to be unnecessary, and the bees can circulate, move the air around just fine on their own, right through a single main entrance, much as they do in the wild or when they're in an abandoned building and an unheated structure and things like that. So when people do rip outs, we pay attention to that too, but that's what changed my mind. Um, just uh, it's unnecessary and they retain warmth in that little warm air bubble that's sealed now because it doesn't vent off through the top. And the bees, as I said, have the ability to move the air as necessary in winter. Uh, so glad to see Randy Oliver's back from his illness, me too. Randy Oliver, for those of you who don't know, had uh, problems with his tongue, and he's back in business. He's talking. His voice has been changed a little bit, but yeah, we were all rooting for him and glad that he's healthy and back in business. Uh, Joel says, you're going to put the Hive Alive fondant in the rapid round. You know, I thought about that, but now that I look at the package, I'm going to pull the rapid round out. I'm going to put the fondant flat directly on that center hole and it'll be cut on the bottom so the bees can start to work their way through that. I see no reason to put it in the wrapid round itself. Like if you have, for example, an inner cover with just that little oval hole in it, you could lay your fondant right on top of that if you don't have space underneath to put your uh, fondant directly on the frames, which is what it's designed to do. But uh, the people in the United Kingdom that have sent me their experience with it, because remember Hive Alive comes from Ireland, by the way, uh, they just lay it right over that hole and the bees work their way up into the packet and then in a radius, they just expand out into the packet. So you can really check it and it's not necessary to take it apart and put it in your rapid round. You can lay it right on that hole. Uh, let's see. Anita says, we live in an old farmhouse and this has been the worst years for yellow jackets in my house. Sometimes as many as three dozen a day must have a crack in the foundation or something. Thoughts? Uh, where is this? See, I'm thankful to live in the northeastern United States where it gets so cold that the yellow jackets run out of forage and then they just abandon their nests this time of year on their own. Um, I would be snooping around with a thermal camera and finding out where those yellow jackets are housed and I would seal that up. You have to kill them, of course. We're going to put the hive live. Okay, let me just... Karen says, greetings, Steve Chubb. I like how you do your video and scientific knowledge, not just personal feelings. Yeah, my feelings are out of here. We're science-based. I studied at Cornell and everything has to be scientifically supported. You can do practical experiments, but also understanding the methodology of an experiment and having a control. And then of course, using whatever altered thing you're going to do to see what the results are. Science is pretty much everything. 
uh, and, and developing your own backyard experiments. There's nothing wrong with that too, but you, you should test things and not just say, oh, look, we did this and the bees did well. Therefore, this is the reason they did well. Unless you have some that you did not do that to and so on, then we have nothing to compare to. So that's where it all comes down. Uh, and thanks for that, by the way. Glad to hear the option for the fondant on the inner cover hole. Yep, yeah, just put it right on there. The newbie journal. Fred, lots of people bake their sugar bricks. I don't want to use heat and sugar. Can we use the mixture without baking? You sure can, because people want to avoid HMF, and it's potentially harmful to the bees. So if you're not a very good person at controlling the parameters, when you make fondant, I'm all about sugar bricks and things like that that are unheated. Why do they even heat it? Well, because it's inverted then. So invertase is supposedly easier. Well, it is easier for the bees to digest. So, uh, but I have no problem with just putting dry sugar has been what I've done historically. The bees consume it, they invert it themselves, and then they use those resources. So it can really get them through winter. I don't heat anything, never have, and the risks are there. I like the foam idea you did on your inner cover too. I like uh, Jim from Vino Farm design as well, probably overkill. Jim, by the way, if you guys have never uh, seen Jim, uh, Vino Farm is his uh, channel name. He's, I haven't had the time to look at his videos, I'm sorry to say. I like that guy a lot, and he, he's really thinking on the go, and he's modifying things. Thank you, Adam. Uh, I should be the one giving you money, by the way. And uh, he's done this super insulated hive, and everybody says, go look at it. Jim's got it figured out. I haven't even had the time to go look at it. I could be doing that instead of talking to you right now, but uh, Jim at Vino Farm check him out. He's on to stuff. And he had profound losses last year. So I hope things really turn around for him this year. But, uh, and that's the cool thing too. Uh, we have a fellowship of beekeepers and uh, people can go off in a lot of different directions. It's not like they're insulting your way if they choose another way of doing things. In fact, it's better if we're all trying out different things at different times. And then we can compare notes and see what worked and didn't. Uh, there's a lot of tribalism kind of for people get personally insulted if they put out a way of doing something and everybody doesn't do that way and they get all mad about it i don't try anything you want and then by the way let me know how that worked out because somebody can be brand new to beekeeping and come up with some new idea or make some observation that's just like astonishing and why everyone hadn't seen it before so uh you can get along with people that are keeping bees or don't believe in the way you keep bees just keep the discussion going that's my thought on that but uh yeah jim is really super insulating everything that's a lot of he's got a huge barn by the way which i don't have i don't have the storage he's got i uh i have a 20 by 32 foot storage 24 by 32 foot storage building so let's see vegas has an odd location i put one one sugar on last week and not a single bee is using it you're still getting all they need late in the year. Well, that's that's good news. If you're putting out sugar syrup and they don't need it, it's great that they're not coming for it. If I walk out there with sugar syrup right now, and by the way, because we're cold already, if we get a warm up, the only thing I would go out to feed them would be pro sweet, full strength, because it's just like honey, except it's not honey, because we know we can't feed honey to the bees from other colonies because we may be spreading pathogens. So pro sweet. Worked really good. I have those cold study videos I still have yet to publish because I'm goofing off too much. How's the Bee Academy planning coming along? Progress on the build and target date for launch. Well, I contacted a contractor. It's called the Way to Be Academy. And we're having a lot of discussions about how to set that up because too many people want to come to it. I know that's probably a good problem to have, but I might be shifting gears on the Way to Be Academy. Uh, I need to get a big slab put in, so I contacted a, a concrete contractor that I know and have known for 20 years. And uh, it may actually be a facility where very few people actually come to it, but it may be where I actually teach about beekeeping from a facility that uh, is set up for YouTubes, for, for video production over physically bringing people in. So we, it might be a little bit of each, but very few people would physically come there now. We're kind of shifting gears and thinking that it might actually be a video production center where we teach about bees. So 
it's in flux right now because contractors are all busy and he didn't show up in October like he was supposed to to give me this lab I want. Uh, hello, Fred. I live close to Blaine, Washington. Do you think that the Asian Hornets will be able to take hold? Well, Sven Spiedeker, the head entomologist up there, at uh, Washington State University, by the way. He went to the same high school my kids did. And uh, he says he's confident. I don't know. Because keep in mind, I'm not there. I'm not an entomologist. I'm also not fighting that fight. But it's pretty... Uh, I don't know. I don't want to be pessimistic about it. Because they're so optimistic that they can find them. They track them. They trap them. And they put uh, Kevlar thread on them. And they have these little transmitters on them. And they fly away. And then they find their nest. But you know what? This time of year, queens are flying out of those Asian giant hornet nests, Vespa mandarinia, and uh, largest hornet in the world, by the way. And, uh, you know, 30, 40, 50 feet up in a tree, I'm not confident, personally, that they're going to find every queen and keep them from spreading. They give it all the traps out they want. They're kind of here. The question is, how much will they progress? So. I, you know, again, I'm not the expert, but I, you know, I talk to those guys as much as I can, as much as they'll put up with me and I get as many questions in as I can. You know, they can fly 50 miles an hour too while you're talking. So they're interesting things, but uh, I don't think they have a handle on them, to be honest. I don't know how they could. How could you? Something like that. It's going to spread and the queens are all going to start their own nests in the spring. So uh, let's see. Thursday night's Friday night's route for me. That's great. Or should I say it will be sweet? And Kenneth, let's see what else we have here. Our association is having conflicts between treatment-free beaks and IPM beaks. It's getting contentious. How can we get to do well? The, you know, beekeepers, I know it's shocking. Some of them have very firm positions on everything. So treatment-free, I mean, there's people that won't even allow you to talk about treatment-free in some companies, some groups, others. Uh, you know, so I think that what people are deciding to do on their own, you're not going to stop them with their own bees. So by keeping the dialogue open and not bullying everybody out of your club, keep them there because you could eventually win each other over to a path that benefits the bees above everything else. Uh, treatment-free uh, if you're on the treatment side of things and you want to show some concerns for the treatment-free beekeeping, if they're not, let me back up a little bit. Genetics play at the top of that approach. So could you be treatment-free? You could, but your genetics have to be the kind of bees that will handle varroa mites on their own. Because when they say treatment-free, we're really talking about varroa destructor mite controls. So you can do that, you know, integrated pest management, uh, you can pull drones, you know, you can do a lot of different things, but the stock of the bees are going to be at the very top of your approach to treatment-free beekeeping. And for me, that's the bee weaver bees. They did very well without treatment, but I always had a couple colonies that got out of hand. And that's what changed my mind after 10 years of beekeeping that I needed to try something instead of just letting the varroa mites take over because the mite is like, the part of the problem that's tangible that we can see, but what they're doing to the bees is well beyond that. So uh, there's a lot of discussion to be had and a lot of approaches to be entertained on both sides of that. But keep the dialogue going. Don't, don't say we are exclusively a treatment-free organization. Everybody else can go jump in a mud puddle or you can say, you know, we treat. And, you know, so they. I think you benefit from one another because as long as people are being honest about what's working and what is not, you can gain headway that way. Let's see, I know I'm gonna miss some of these questions here. Hello, here in Australia, have you heard of or used liquid smoke? If you have any pros or cons on using liquid smoke, I've heard that it's good during fire warning days, but not much else. Liquid smoke, I've been told uh, to put on your hands to keep the bees from stinging your fingers and things like that. I've not heard of it as being used to control bees or in place of regular smoke for opening your hive. Uh, most people know that I also use uh, sugar syrup with honeybee healthy in it as a spritz instead of smoke on super hot days because I don't want to smoke the bees and stress them and get them to consume a bunch of their honey if they don't need to and instead can reward them. So you can use a little bit of both. Smoke it sometimes, 
sugar syrup with honey be healthy or something in it, some essential oil uh, that gets them to feed on that. And by the way, spritz that near the middle, not around the edges, or your bees will be on the edges eating the syrup that you sprayed on there uh, when you're trying to close up your hives. But uh, both work. Liquid smoke, I have no experience with other than that I was told uh, people put it on their hands to help them keep the bees off their hands. Uh, how cool you're doing a live stream. I'm actually surprised myself, Doug, because uh, my internet is fast all of a sudden. So here we go. Let me know when I could take your classes when you start them so I can book being there sometime. Thanks, Steve Chubb, for that vote of confidence. My problem, see, and that's why we're talking about a different way of teaching. I wanted to have a core group of only 10 people because that's a meaningful, hands-on uh, education number group because I would have teams of five, right? Five teams, two in each, so 10 people. And then everybody wanted to be a part of it. So I don't know that I'm going to be able to teach in person because we're going to have to, we just would end up with a waiting list that's so long. So I'm trying to find a way to reach more people uh, because it's a one year program, by the way, meaning one beekeeping year. So starting in spring all the way through fall, uh, bringing people out once a, once a week or something like that. So it's not like people would come and stay here and be around. So that's the other end of it too. So I think uh, some kind of uh, online teaching for that way to be academy is probably the more practical thing these days, but we'll see. It's all up in the air. Anything could happen. But thank you. Just received two varroa infested untreated colonies that went from three full deeps to three frames of bees last week. Put both in my favorite six frame polystyrene. Splittable nukes after OEV survivable. I don't even know. It sounds like they're in trouble because uh, even once you get, because they're in profound decline, once you get the varroa mites under control, uh, you still got the pathogens left over, all the disease that they've spread to your bees. We've got bees that won't live as long as they should, that can't produce as well as they should. We have nurse bees that can't attend to the brood as well as they should. So we have real problems. Uh, once a, a colony has been so profoundly impacted by the varroa destructor mite that they're in rapid decline, that's a crashing colony. So very difficult to get them back to, unless you're somewhere where you're in spring and you're just coming out of winter. But if you're going into winter, that's a, that's a wiped out colony, I think. You know, I'm just, I'm not saying to give up, but you're, you have an uphill climb ahead. New beekeeper in Texas here. If we were to get snowed, like in February, what do you recommend doing to help the bees with the cold? Well, the bees handle, you know, they handle the cold really well as long as they have food resources in the hive. If the hive is sealed up well, so you haven't done a lot of late season manipulation of the hive components to where they haven't sealed with propolis. If you have a single entrance down below, I had bees years ago get through blizzard conditions with no insulation at all, just big healthy hives with uh, a bunch of honey stored, 50 to 100 pounds. So in Texas, you know, if they're healthy bees, they're going to sustain that. Uh, and I know that blasted people a lot last year because they're in an area, I guess because too, they're Southern bees. So sometimes they have too much brood in there. That's where they end up in a lot of trouble because they have to eat the brood that they have and they're trying to survive. And then we get this cold snap. So I guess insulate if you have that coming, if you've got some plan that you can do that. Um I think it's important, but uh, I've had bees get through horrendous conditions uh, without insulation at all. But now that I've started insulating the tops, insulated inner cover, feeder, and then an insulated outer cover on that. Last year, I just had the insulated outer covers on everything with my old feeder shims, which, by the way, now need to be insulated. Uh, just insulated on top puts everything so much ahead. It's unbelievable. So, Adam Holmes, off topic. Have you looked into... Starlink for internet. Don't have to, Adam, because pretty soon I'm going to have the super fast. By the way, Starlink wants like a $450 deposit. That's Elon Musk's program. And you got to read the reviews on that. A lot of people are not happy, but I'm going to have fiber optics here really soon. So things are going to be fast for me. I'm not going to be driving to upload my Friday Q&As anymore. I'm going to do it right here. Armstrong is the name of the company. Uh, what temperament should you expect to have 
with the broodminder thermometers just above the lower brood box. What temperatures? So they should be in the high 80s near the center. And if it's an insulated upper cavity, here's what I've noticed about my colonies. We have 21 colonies. We're going down to 20 pretty fast here. Uh, with the insulated inner cover in the outer box, um, they're staying hot. So they're in the 80s at the top. We know that the cluster where the brood is, is going to be from 94 to 97 degrees Fahrenheit. Beyond that, with the insulated inner cover and everything, I've noticed a much bigger heat pocket up there. Ryan McDonough is the one that pointed out to me when I was doing my thermals, I thought all my bees had moved to the top early and bypassed all the resources that they had stored to get them through winter. And now they're clustered underneath the insulated inner covers already, but it may not be the case because Ryan, who by the way, has done a lot of really good work looking into the thermal dynamics inside the unvented hive. Uh, it's actually a hot heat pocket not the cluster of bees themselves. So Ryan was right. It looked, because we're using a thermal camera looking at the exterior of the hive, it looked like they had all migrated up there, but really it's just the retention of heat up there, which pushes that dew point down, which means there's no condensation that's gonna happen up there. But uh, it's very easy to see. My, my thing is to see if the bees are alive or dead in winter. And you can tell how big the brood is inside your hive by how warm it is beyond the mantle of your cluster. Because remember, I'm not measuring temperatures inside the cluster itself. I don't have the means to do that. These broodminder things just look like this. Just a little strip here. And then you put this up on top of the top box for me. And so because that's where the heat pocket is, the temperatures up there are pretty impressive. So uh, but then the brood is way down here. So we're not actually getting brood temperature, but we are finding out uh, uh, there will be a spike in temperature in the spring, in theory, when they start to build brood and they start to consume more resources. And of course, the cluster moves closer to the top. So we'll know things like that. Plus, you can check these with your phone and see what's going on. Some people have reported the batteries may not last as long as they should, but those are just tests for me this year. So in the 80s, Hello from Greece. Are honeybees hornets? That's from Greystone Gardens. Honeybees and hornets are a completely different species. Apis mellifera is the honeybee. Mellifera, the honey transporter. So, and uh, so apis and then vespids. Vespidae are the hornets and wasps. So they are very different. They're different species entirely. Some people say the honeybees are uh, vegan wasps, but they also have hair on them. So, but they're they're entirely different species. Uh, let's see. Hit the thumbs on the way in. It helps Fred. Does it really this thumbs up help me? Thank you for that. Uh, thanks for all you do. You're welcome, Kimberly. Thank you for being here. And why are you going from 21 hides to 20? See, you had to ask. This is laned. Why am I going from 21 colonies to 20? Yes, number seven is crashing. Hive seven. The ones that were being attacked, the tiny underdog colony, their heat signature is so small. I don't know how they're going to survive anything. Uh, they can't even take on resources. That's how tiny they are. Of course, they're going to get a hive alive fondant pack. I'm going to do everything I can to see if they can get through. And they are still generating warmth in hive number seven. They're in a single deep. Um, they're alive, they're in there, but they're only occupying two and a half to three frames. And uh, they're gonna need constant care. So that's what's going on. Yes, it's hive number seven. The good news is though, the storm swarm that we gathered from the tree and the rain and the wind and everything else, they're very strong. So there are lots of upsides here. So here's hive from Northeast Ohio. Hello back to Mike. Do you know of any reason that the workers would chew a queen's wings? Uh, if they're chewing or doing anything to damage the queen that's in the hive, uh, they're rejecting her. She's done. That there's The chances are high that's not even the primary queen in the hive. Uh, but if they're attacking and damaging the queen, they're rejecting her and she's on her way out. 
So they don't do that to the primary laying queen in the hive. Sometimes there's more than one queen in the hive and they can start to brutalize another one if she seems to get in the way. So there's Russell, Fred, thank you so much for your candid and honest approach to backyard beekeeping. Enjoy watching it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So good notes there from Russell. I think we're coming. We're past my 30 minute. Oh, I did 35 minutes, I think. My bees have gone down to the bottom box, was sinking with the insulated inner cover. They were up in the top prematurely, but not so. See, William Bowers, same thing. It threw me off because it's insulated inner cover that we're testing this year. Because keep in mind, in the past, I had the insulated outer cover, but I had my feeder shims, which had a solid wood inner cover and no insulation except for the top box. So there's a void in there that did not allow the bees to get right up against something that was insulated. So this year with the insulated inner covers, um, that's a that's impressive. Every single hive is glowing at the top. I mean, that's that's impressive stuff. So I'm looking forward to good things with that. And he's right, you know, the bees themselves are much lower. It's the secondary heat from the cluster that's risen and is being retained there. The heat pocket that all the scientists have been talking about. So I guess there is something to science after all, and it works. Let's see, hello from Indiana. Thanks for the hive gates and great info. Yep, that's the other thing we're doing. A lot going on this winter. The, so the insulated inner covers, the hive gate channels. I know people hate it, that's what these are. And those are doing really good. And by the way, we handed out the last two winners, I think, at the Way to Be Fellowship on Facebook and the Hivegate Citizen Science Group on Facebook. Uh, but those are giving great. Kimberly says, can you give us a tour someday? Sure, I'll give it to you right now. There's my hooded bee suit. Flow Hive 2. Flow Hive 2. Right back there is my pollen trap. There's my bee chasing box, bee lining, tracking wild bees. I know. I don't know what kind of tour you want to see, but tour the bee yard, I guess, or something. But we could just do a thing on all the little knickknacks and things around here. Uh, wait to tell about Thanksgiving to put on sugar on top of my hives for winter in Michigan so they don't move up to the top box and stay clustered in the bottom box till later in winter. They're fanning at the entrance on a 45 degree day. Don't know what to make of it. They're just moving air. If they're moving air and they're doing stuff, a little fanning at the entrance, that's fine by me. Rodney Middleton, glad to see you here. Printable Science, I wanted to send you something. Is there a mailing address? Let me tell everybody my mailing address right now. <laughs> but but uh, you can message me. So send me a message. Through. The best way is to go to uh, Fred's Fine Fowl on Facebook or uh, The Way to Be on Facebook and just send a message there. And we can talk. Uh, let's see what else. Interesting stuff. Let's see. Taylor Boys, glad to see you. What are your personal favorite breed of queen? Okay, it goes without saying. The Bee Weaver Queens out of Texas. I know a lot of people go, what? Texas? Hot weather bees? And they'll attack everybody and they'll kill everything. Uh, the Bee Weaver line of bees... Um, if you go to the Bee Weaver website and watch the video to see how they arrived at their line of bees and how they went treatment free, whole hog took huge losses and let them genetically distill themselves. And one of the traits that they have, aside from being able to get rid of, to chew off varroa mites, which I've seen and documented, I wouldn't lead you wrong. If they didn't work up here, I wouldn't get them myself. So they work fantastic. Uh, Adam Holmes. Hope to see you at Hive Life. If you're going to be there, Adam, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give Adam a patch right here. This is going to be for you. Look, the camera even blows that out. These are iron on patches, by the way. Oh, wait, it's too late. I already gave Adam patches. So <laughs> I don't know what to give Adam. He does, he's the one that does all the timestamps for all my videos. 
uh, which I use also on the podcast and people can listen to the podcast and they link that and they go right and see the part of the video. So he's invaluable to everything we do here. So I don't know what to do for Adam, but I will buy you coffee at the Hive Life Conference. And so that'll be great to see people there. Uh, what else is going on? What type of insulation are you using on the inner cover? I've used Reflectix with a pillow case with pine shavings. I don't use anything that will absorb moisture. So closed cell. Uh, now the insulated inner cover is this. It looks like polystyrene. It comes pre-made, so I'm not making it. It just comes that way. It's an R10. And then I'm using expansion foam for other parts away from the bees. But uh, I would not put any, I don't personally, see here's the difference. I don't put any pillows or things that have any potential to absorb moisture. I know a lot of people will say that, you know, it wicks away the moisture and it vents off later. Uh, moistened insulated material inside a hive or anywhere else defeats the insulative properties of the material. Therefore, something that's closed cell, like a polystyrene, is a much better insulator. So, but then again, that's the other thing, the, this is an insulated inner cover, but if you notice, there's a hard plastic casing around it so the bees can't chew that. If you just took this polystyrene and put it on top of your box inside the hive, bees are gonna chew it. I guarantee you, because I've had them chew B-Max covers uh, and just they, they propolize it all up and then somebody explained that to me that they think it's like pulp wood inside a bee tree uh, to where decomposing wood would be very porous like polystyrene is. So they chew it and then they try to propolize it to seal it up because they see it as something that's rotting and decaying away. It's kind of interesting. Uh, thank you for the live chat. Thank you, glad to be here. I'm just sorry about all this weird exposure. The lighting and the way it's working is, I need to fix some stuff. I did notice that when I put this thing up here, that it darkened. See that? That's the expo. I just need to hold this next to my face for the whole thing. So the auto exposure stuff on this camera, not impressed. Uh, are you winter feeding your horizontal long laying lands hive? Nope. The horizontal long, uh, the horizontal long Langstroth hive. They have a pile of resources already there. I don't foresee feeding them at all. Uh, the Layens Hive, super insulated hive, they also have a bunch of resources and the colony of bees in there is very small. Uh, so I don't see having to feed them either. Now the Layens Hive, there's no facility for feeding them other than these frame feeders. And I don't like that at all. The good news is they have enough capped honey to get them through winter. So, and they're plenty insulated, so they're good to go. Uh, so I will not be feeding uh, those hives. And I do have on the horizontal hive, the long lang, there's a hole. If you know, they have stored easily 60 pounds of honey in there and have all that they need. If they look like they're in trouble, I'm going to put those hive alive fondant patties over that hole and see what happens. So there's a lot of testing and observation to be done around here. Uh, let's see, Taylor boys, I'm using two inch foam on some hives this year, cut holes for the jar feeders. Bees are eating the foam. That's why they have access to the foam. Um, you can't give the bees access to the foam. They'll chew it. My chickens will eat a B-Max cover completely. That's how full of common sense my chickens are. So yeah, when you're using any kind of foam, rigid foam insulation, stuff like that, you have to encapsulate it in some way. Sandwich it between wood, uh, that's why that Be Smart inner cover, we might think, oh, well, let's just put insulin on there. It's the plastic casing around it that's actually the real key to the whole thing. Uh, they do eat foam. They can chew it, and they can chew holes where you don't want them. So it's just, uh, you need to paint the foam, Anita says, so the bees won't chew it. So, but there, now you have to consider what kind of paint you're putting on there, whether or not uh, you want your bees chewing your paint, but if they won't chew it at all, if you use some kind of, so I'm gonna guess a latex gloss paint that uh, you have to paint your outer covers anyway, if they're just B-Max covers. So Anita says, paint the foam. That would be a good test. So uh, put some painted gloss paint, and uh, latex paint would be my recommendation because once it's dry, it can be non-toxic. And then uh, see if the bees don't chew it. It's a good test right there. 
Yep, they love to eat it. Is your chicken book still available? Thank you for asking, Russell. Uh, the, <laughs> that uh, It's a chicken video, by the way, that published in 2006. It's a DVD. It was uh, the most popular backyard be uh, chicken guide. It's a three-hour long DVD. Uh, it's available only through my website, fredsfinefowl.com. I stopped selling them on Amazon. And uh, they used to be sold by Murray McMurray and a bunch of other hatcheries. But you know what? People are so spoiled now, they're just streaming everything. And let me spoil it further. That entire three-hour presentation on raising backyard chickens is available through my YouTube channel. And uh, I don't know if it's called Regarding Chickens, but if you just look at my chicken videos and see the one that's three hours long, that's it. From incubation to shipping to breeding to growth and development, you know, we follow chickens from hatching all the way through six months of age. So they're laying and everything else. Uh, so that is available free right on YouTube. Uh, so just look for that. A couple of people have watched it. So let's see what else. Uh, do, 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 do. Put the entrance reducers. Last two weeks, one hive propolizing half of the reducer closed. Is that normal? Well, this is from Adele, and let me tell you, they're letting you know they want a smaller opening. So if they want to propolize it, I say let them, because uh, they can get it right down to just, you know, a few bees. I have colonies right now that have openings. Uh, they're the ones with the three-quarter inch holes in them instead of a bottom board entrance, so it's elevated, and uh, it's half it's half the three-quarter inch hole. So... They do like to tighten them up. They can manipulate propolis. So if they want to close it up, I would let them. They can uh, handle surprisingly small entrances with surprisingly large cavities beyond it. That's what's impressive. That's also why at Hive Life Conference, I can't wait to talk to Mr. Ed and Dirt Rooster 626 or whatever their name, Randy something. Anyway, I want to talk to those guys because they do rip outs everywhere and i'm going to soak their brains for information about how big the openings were what's the largest colony you found with the tiniest entrance things like that it's just going to be fun to know because i don't think they do enough statistical analysis on the physical dimensional traits of the rip outs that they do flip my bottom bolts in the fall which is about three inches to keep the mice out that's true the bottom boards it says steve chubb says he flips his bottom bolts but i know he really means bottom boards because the reversible solid bottom boards flip over. They have the winner three eighths inch side, and he's exactly right. Uh, they your mice cannot get through uh, the three eighths inch opening. So yeah, but a lot of people don't want to lift all their hives off and reverse everything. So then they just take an entrance reducer and put it in there, and that's what a three eighths inch three eighths inch hole looks like right there. So, or for those who are using the hive gates, by the way, these two mice can't get in them. Look how tiny that is. So, yep, no mouse guard necessary. What you do need to do, though, don't forget, scrape out dead bees from the entrance that you do have. So get yourself some kind of tool, chopsticks. This is the one that they were... Given or they're four dollars, I think, at uh, Better Bee right now, but they were giving them away with the insulated inner cover purchases. But that thing reaches all the way in the back, and you scrape out your dead bees. There are some people that never scrape out dead bees in wintertime, and then uh, what they don't realize is the pile of dead bees on the bottom board of your hive not only are they potentially blocking the entrance of your beehive and keeping your bees from getting in and out when they need to do those cleansing flights, uh, but they also generate a lot of moisture and uh, they decompose and they stink like a dead animal. So the more of those you can scrape out, that's why this is kind of cool because look how far it will reach into your bottom board and you can just keep scraping out the dead bees. The more dead bees you get out of the bottom, the fewer dead bees your undertaker bees have to remove when the weather gets clean. Because when they do get a temperature break, your bees are flying out and doing cleansing flights first. They're taking care of business. So after they've done the cleansing flights, next thing they're doing is they're gathering water and resources for melting snow and stuff like that. So the very last thing they're going to do is be hauling out dead bees. So the more that you can do that for your bees, the better off they're going to be. Let's see. Rodney's talking about uh, we had temps in the middle 70s. Good for you, Rodney. We had temps at 42 was the high today. 
So let's see what else. So I'm robbing reduced entrance to three quarter inch wide opening should. That's the other thing. See, still having robbing. Now I don't know where MSM. Oh, from Tennessee. Okay. So in the north, you think everything's shut down. It's over with. But uh, on those warmer days, there's still a strong foraging force in these colonies. And they go out there and they attack smaller, weaker colonies. The threat of robbing is not over with. The threat of robbing for us from the yellow jackets is over with. The threat, the threat of robbing from other bees is still on. So, yeah, entrances reduced and stuff like that. Of course, this is probably one of the most popular things, these robbing screens. You see these kind of everywhere, and they come with pins. And if you've got a colony that's at risk of being robbed, this goes right over the cover, and they flip up in one of these upper entrances like that. So what is going on with the exposure on this thing? Anyway, my time's up. So I'm sorry if you asked a question that we didn't get to. I am going to do my standard Q&A tomorrow. So we're going to answer the questions that were submitted. Uh, some of them are pretty lengthy. So I just wanted to get on tonight. I was planning to do 30 minutes and then zip out of here. But I think I've gone beyond that because I think I started around 8 and it's now 8.49. But if you like these live streams, if you like the live Q&A kind of stuff right now, just hanging out, drinking hot chocolate and seeing who's who and where everybody's at. Uh, let me know down in the comments and, and I'll try to fix this uh, <laughs> exposure. That's just ridiculous. But thank you all for being here tonight and for the good questions that you put out. And thanks for getting along. I did not have to block or delete or remove one single person for being obnoxious. So thanks a lot. I hope you guys uh, come back tomorrow and watch the video of the week and then uh, have a great weekend after that. Thanks for being here tonight.